Shabbat Yom, brothers and sisters, Hebrews in Jamaica, the Caribbeans to the West, to the four corners of the earth, scattered greetings. This Shabbat lesson we're going to title it, What Language Was the New Testament Written in, Brothers and Sisters? What Language Was the New Testament Written in? Right? The New Testament was originally Greek, written in Greek, right? The New Testament was originally written in Greek. This claim is not particularly controversial among biblical scholars, though some have argued that parts of the New Testament were originally written in Hebrew or Aramaic. Some popular writers and religious groups, however, have claimed that much or all of the New Testament was originally written in Hebrew or Aramaic. In this article, we will survey the evidence and arguments that led the vast majority of scholars today to believe that the original language of the New Testament was Greek, right? In order to identify the original language of the New Testament, it is important to understand the language situation in the first century AD before the exile of Yehuda. In the early 6th century BC, Hebrew was the main spoken and written language in ancient Israel and Yehuda, and most of the Old Testament was originally written in Hebrew. Under Persian imperial rule in the 6th through the early 4th century BC, Aramaic became the official language of government and most scribal education, and it gradually become or became the most common spoken language in the region. And that region is not East Africa and the surrounding areas, you see. Right? So, under Persian imperial rule in the 6th to the early 4th century BC, Aramaic became the official language of government and most scribal education, and it gradually became the most common spoken language in the region. Hebrew and Aramaic are closely related languages of the so called, of the, of the As As Semitic people. Right, Hebrew and Aramaic are closely related language of the Semitic branch of the Afroasiatic family, right? Afroasiatic family, and they mix and influence each other to a large extent during this period. Some portions of the Old Testament were originally written in Aramaic, especially parts of Daniel and Ezra, as were some of the Dead Sea Scrolls and other early uh, Yuhadi literature. With the conquest of Alexander the Great in the late 4th century, Greek gained prominence as the common language of government, trade, and elite culture throughout the Eastern Mediterranean, including Judea and Galilee. By the 3rd century BC, at the latest, the Yuhadin expatriate community in Mithraim, Egypt, had largely lost the ability to speak Hebrew and or Aramaic, and so they translated the books of the Hebrew into their native Greek. These translations, collectively called the Septuagint, became the main scriptures used in the Yuhadin diaspora, Yuhadin people living outside of the land of Israel. Many Jewish works from the diaspora, as well as some from Judea, were also written in Greek in this period. Thus, by the time of the first century AD, the language situation in Palestine was very complicated and multilingual. Aramaic appears to have been the most common spoken language, especially among the working classes. Hebrew continued to be used for prior and to be composed religious texts, such as many of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and there is some evidence that Hebrew also continued to be used as spoken language in some circles. Greek was widely spoken in the area as well, especially by Yuhadins from higher socioeconomic classes and those who had reason to interact with their Gentile neighbors. Thus, 
language used for many spoken or written interaction depending on who was involved and the purpose of the conversation and greek allowed for the widest possible dissemination of written works throughout the mediterranean world you see brothers and sisters looking at the manus my manuscript evidence right beyond this general linguistic background the manuscript evidence is a crucial part of addressing the question of what language the new testament was written in here the evidence is unequivocal the new testament is a corpus of greek composition the institutes for the new testament textual research has documented over 5000 greek manuscripts containing parts or all of the new testament ranging from the second century a.d into the early modern era this greek tradition ultimately was and is a source for all known translation of the New Testament into other languages, ancient and modern. This includes ancient translation into Latin, Coptic, Syriac, Ethiopic, Armenian, and Gogarian. It also includes, of course, modern translation into countless. It also includes, of course, modern translation into countless languages around the world. In sharp contrast, there are no ancient Hebrew manuscripts of the New Testament whatsoever. Some lead antiquity. Antiqui Jewish polemical works do include Hebrew translation of parts of the New Testament, but the earliest extant Hebrew version of a complete New Testament book is right is the fourteenth century version of Matthew including in a polemical work by the Jewish scholar Shem Tov. This Hebrew version like a predates Shem Tov, but it has many elements from Latin and medieval vernacular languages that prove that it is a lay translation ultimately derived from the known Greek matter rather than reflecting an original Hebrew version of the book. The books of the New Testament have also been translated into Hebrew on multiple occasions in modern times but these are irrelevant for the question of the original language of the New Testament, you see brothers and sisters. The situation with Aramaic is more difficult since there are ancient copies of the New Testament in different dialects of Aramaic. Even after the first century AD, Aramaic continued to be widely spoken in the Eastern Mediterranean, Mesopotamia, and the surrounding areas in a wide variety of local dialects. These dialects cannot exactly be considered Yahusha's mother's tongue. Yahusha's mother tongue, because they changed considerably over time, have varied significantly from place to place given the, the growth of the believers in the East. It is no surprise that both the Old and New Testament were translated into these dialects and revised multiple times between the 2nd and the 7th century. These versions are usually called the Syriac which is one of the most widely used and well-documented dialects of Aramaic. Another noteworthy translation was made into uh, the believing Palestinian Aramaic dialect, which has more Palestinian influence than the other versions. While these Aramaic New Testament versions were made already in antiquity, the scholarly census is clear that they were translation mostly from the Greek into later Aramaic dialect. They were not original Aramaic version of the New Testament's books. The fact that even the earlier Syriac translation had to rely on Greek manuscripts is a good indication that Hebrew or Aramaic copies of the New Testament were unavailable already in the early centuries AD. The manuscript tradition thus strongly indicates a Greek origin for all the books of the New Testaments. You see, brothers and sisters. Right? Given the manuscript evidence by why do some argue for Hebrew or Aramaic original for at least parts of the New Testament? One of the strongest reasons is the body tradition. The ancient believer historian Isibius cited a believer's writers from the second century named Papias who claimed Matthew collected arranged the saying of Yahusha in the Hebrew dialect manner, and everyone translated interpreted them as they were able. This was understood by many early believers writers to mean that the Gospel of Ma Matthias, who was originally written in Hebrew and later translated into Greek. Irenaeus Origen, Isibius 
Augustine, Jerome, and others interpreted Papaya's statement this way. But as many modern scholars have pointed out, this brief statement contains many ambiguities that make it difficult to understand and assess its veracity. You see, veracity. So what does it mean that Mattia, who collected arranged the scenes, did this? Did he simply write a document collecting scenes of Yahusha that was used as a source for composing the complete Gospels? Or does it mean that he wrote in Hebrew the entire Gospel of Matthias, who, as we know it today, including all of the narrative? What does Hebrew dialect manner, manner mean? Some scholars interpret this as meaning simply that Matthias, who arranged the scenes in a typical Juhadin way and indeed Matthias who is often thought to to reflect a very Juhadin believing understanding of the life and words of Yahusha. But even if Papias was referring to the composition in a Semitic language, it is not entirely clear whether it would refer to Hebrew or to Aramaic. In ancient texts, the word Hebrew could also be used to refer to the language we now call Aramaic with the Hebrew perhaps better understood as the language typical of the Hebrew Palestinian Yuadins. And finally, what does the word translated interpreted mean in this context? In Greek literature, it is used to refer to interpretation and exposition, sometimes but not always including translation from one language to another. Thus, why this is early tradition undoubtedly merits attention due to its antiquity. It is far from obvious what Papias meant and whether he had accurate information. Indeed, there is no evidence that any early Yuhadin or believers writer ever actually had access to a Hebrew or Aramaic original of Matayahu, nor does anyone cite from such Hypothetical text in the 5th century, the famous believer textual scholar Jerome was sent to the Holy Land and, and tasked with translating the Old and New Testament from the original languages into Latin. He came across an Aramaic gospel used by the Yuhadin sects of the Nazarene and Ebonites, right? Ebonites, which he subsequently translated into Greek. These sects claim that their gospel, Bezora, also called Bezora, according to the Hebrews, was the original version of Matthias, who written in Hebrew. Though initially intrigued, Jerome appears ultimately not to have been convinced, and he translated his Latin version of Matthias instead from the canonical Greek version. Right. Other believing fathers also discuss the contents of the gospel according to the Hebrews, which is in many respects very far removed from the canonical Greek Matthias who received in the Orthodox Church. At one point, Jerome cites an a supposed saying of Yahusha from the gospel according to the Hebrew that cannot have been from an original Hebrew version but seems to be dependent upon the Greek version of Matthias who in the Greek Gospel of Matthias who. The author quotes John the Baptist mm -hmm. saying that Yahusha does not need to be baptized and Yahusha saying that it is necessary to, to fulfill all righteousness. Okay, brothers and sisters, let's look at Matthias who, 3, colon, 14 to 15. That's Matthias who, Matthew 3. Colin 14 to 15 is on the screen, right, brothers and sisters? Okay, brothers and sisters, right? But Yohakinin, John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Yahusha answered and said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. So, you see, in that moment, Yahusha and Yohakinin is working hand in hand to fulfill the prophecy. You see, because Yahakinin is part of that prophecy in order to be fulfilled. That Yahakinin will baptize the Mashiach, Yahusha. Even though John recognized that he's not worthy, right, of him baptizing the Mashiach. But he suffered it to be so, right? The Mosai came humble as was prophesied, a lamb to the slaughter, you see. 
and all these things were fulfilled in Matthias Huber and sisters, right? So, preempting the theological question of why Yahusha would need to undergo John's baptism of repentance if he was without sin, the Bezorah, according to the Hebrew cited by Jerome, had a non canonical saying of Yahusha in which he explicitly denies his need for baptism because of his sinlessness. This statement pro provides a clear safeguard responding to the theological problem first raised in the Greek Matthias, and it is implausible that such an important statement would have been left out in translation if the Bezorah according to the Hebrews really had been the Hebrew original of Matthias. Thus this Hebrew gospel can by no means be considered a Semitic original behind our canonical Greek Matthias. It appears to be a separate apocryphal gospel depend upon Matthias. This is similarly claimed that the second century believers, philosophers and missionary Pantanius, right? Pantanius, brothers and sisters, found a Hebrew version of Matthew in India. The local believers claimed that this was the original Hebrew of Matthew passed on by the Apostle Bartholomew, but this is probably no more credible as evidence for a now lost Hebrew original than the Ebonites. Gospel according to the Hebrews, the latter example proved that such biased claim cannot be accepted uncritically. And there is no reason to think that Pantanius was linguistically competent to evaluate the evidence himself. Thus, the evidence from the tradition for a Hebrew original remains almost entirely dependent upon the ambiguous claim of Papias and certain by certain sects that the priority of their own preferred gospel and this applies only to the book of Matthew, not the other books of the New Testament, for most of which there is no early uh, body tradition or Semitic original at all. So I'll give you a little brief history about the, the Ebonites, because I mentioned this in, in this in this in this search right here with you, this lesson right here by the Ebonites, the e, the Ebonai derived from Hebrew, right? The Eboanai derived from Hebrew, right? Eboanim, meaning the poor or poor ones, as a term referred to a Yuadin believing sect which viewed poverty as a blessing, right? That exists during the early centuries of the common era. The Ebonites embraced an adoptionist Christology, Thus understanding Yahushua of Nazareth as a mere man who by virtue of his righteousness. So they don't they don't they don't believe that he is the son of Elohim and that he's divine and that he was born from a virgin. Right? So that's that sect. You see, brothers and sisters. So they adopt this uh Christology, thus understanding Yahushua of Nazareth as a mere man who by virtue of his righteousness in following the law of Moses was chosen by Elohim to be the Mashiachs, you see, so you know, many consider them as as heretic, you see, because they deny the divinity of Yahusha, just like many pastors today who will not preach the true name of Yahusha, deny his divinity, and deny his uh, uh, miracle, miraculous birth from his virgin mother, you see. So, what does it mean? That Matthias who collected a ring the saying did he simply write a document collecting saints of Yahusha that was used as a source for composing the complete Bezorah? Or does he mean that he wrote in Hebrew the entire Gospel of Matthew as we know it today including all the narrative? What does Hebrew dialect manner means? Some scholars right some scholars interpret this as meaning simply that Matthias who arranged the saying in a typical Yuhadin way and indeed Matthias, Matthias who is often thought to reflect a very Yuhadin understanding of the life and the word of Yahusha but even if Papias was referring to composition in a Semitic language it is not entirely clear whether it would refer to Hebrew or to Aramaic. In ancient texts, the word Hebrew could also be used to refer to the language we now call Aramaic. The Hebrew perhaps better understood as the language typical of the Hebrew Palestinian Jews. 
One other church tradition, one other body tradition worthy of mention, suppose that the letter to the Hebrews was first written by Paul in Hebrew or Americ and only later translated into Greek, but the early church theories about the origin of the letter of the Hebrews are conflicting and debated. Indeed, origin uh, origin one of the few body fathers who actually knew Hebrew already argued that the book's high literary Greek style implies that Hebrews was first written in Greek by a very skilled writer. Right? In there is there any linguistic evidence for the use of the Hebrew or Aramaic in the New Testament? Yes, brothers and sisters, especially in the saying of Yahushua in the Bezora, like most you had deans of the time in Palestine. Yahusha, the first language was undoubtedly Aramaic. Yahusha's first language was undoubtedly Aramaic. Often Yahusha's sayings are still preserved in Aramaic in the Greek New Testament and even modern translation. For example, let's look in. Let's look at Mark, brothers and sisters. Mark five, brothers and sisters. And Marcus five, colon thirty nine to forty one is on the screen. Right, take a look at the screen, brothers and sisters. Mark five. Call in Thursday to 41. And when he was coming, he said unto them, Why make ye this ado? Ado means trouble, right? Fuss, right? And weep. The damsel is not dead. So Mashak is uh, re re encouraging and reinforcing the damsel is not dead but asleep. She sleepeth, and they laugh him to scorn because they did not believe, brothers and sisters. So that's why the, 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 the response was laughter. Right, mockery, scorn. But when he had put them all out, he taketh the father and the mother of the damsel and them that were with him and entered in where the damsel was lying. And he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talitha, come, Talitha, come, Talitha, come, which is being interpreted, damsel, I say unto thee, arise. And she did arise, brothers and sisters. Right? Right, brothers and sisters, and verse 42, right? After the most, I give her a direct order. Talitha, come, Talitha, come, which being, which is being interpreted, damsel, I say, unto thee, arise. And in verse 30, 42, and straightway the damsel arose and walked, for she was of the age of 12 years old. And they were astonished with a great astonishment. And he charged them straightly that no man should know it. And commanded that something should be given her to eat. Why did the Mosai charge them to tell no man about this situation? Because the hour of the Mashiach had not yet come. That's the reason, brothers and sisters. You see, that's the whole reason of it. So Yahusha tell a little girl, Talitha Kami, which be which is Aramaic for little girl get up or damsel, you know, girl get up. Right, let's look let's look at Mark again. Marcus seven colon thirty four. Okay, brothers and sisters, let's look at Marcus thirty we're gonna start at thirty two to thirty four, right? It's on the screen, brothers and sisters, right? And they bring unto him one that was deaf and had an impediment in his speech. Impediment mean, you know, they stammer, you know, they you know, they have in speech impaired, right? In his speech, and they beseech him to put his hand upon him. And he took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers into his ear, and he spat and touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said unto him, Ephatha, Epatha, that is, be open. Right? Ephatha, right, brothers and sisters, Ephatha. That is being open. Right? Aramaic. Right, brothers and sisters? Ephatha. Right? Let's look at another scripture, brothers and sisters. Right? Matthew. Uh, not Matthew. Still in Mark. Mark 15, colon 34. Right? So we're showing the evidence of the Hebrew or Aramaic language. Right, brothers and sisters? In scripture. I'm sure we're showing the evidence. Right? Right. So Mark 15, colon. 34 right okay brothers let's take a look at the screen right mark marcus 15 we're going to take it from 32 to 34 let mashiach the king of israel descend now from the cross so they're mocking him right they're mocking the mashiach let 
Mashiach, the King of Israel, descended from the cross, that we may see and believe, and they that are crucified with him revile him. Right? And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Yahushua cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, my Elohim, my Elohim, why hast thou forsaken me? And and I believe uh, uh, in, 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 in Psalms 2, where it balances uh, in the Tehelelim Psalms, King David uh, mentioned that too in Psalms 22, colon 1. Right? In Psalm 22, colon 1, which is in Aramaic, translation of the Hebrew of Psalms 22, colon 1. And in John 1, colon 42, Yahushua called uh, uh, Simon Caiaphas, which is the Aramaic word for rock, an equivalent in meaning to the Greek word Patras, hence Peter. Yahushua Aramaic saying are not limited to personal interaction with others in stories, but are also evident in his teaching. In Matthew 5, 22. Right, brothers and sisters? Yahushua commands his followers not to insult each other with the Aramaic word, Raka, empty, head. In Matthew 6, 24. Right? Yahushua says that one cannot love Elohim and Mammon, the Hebrew Aramaic word for money and wealth. Right, Mammon. So you see, brothers and sisters, you see, you see, you see evidence of the of of the the interaction with Hebrew and America is very very similar, right? So the fact that these and other words of Yahusha are preserved in Aramaic, even in otherwise Greek New Testament texts, suggests two things. First, they establish that they are indeed probably originally spoken by Yahusha in Aramaic. Second, they suggest that the Greek texts of the Gospel are not all translation from a Semitic original. If the entire text of the Gospel had been in Aramaic, why would a translation have preserved these phases or phrases in Aramaic instead of replacing them with the Greek translation in the rest of the text? If the Gospel was originally written in Greek, or on the other hand, it makes sense why Aramaic sayings would occasionally be quoted in the original, often accompanied by translation to prove the reader's with a more authentic feeling access to Yahusha original words and to increase credibility by demonstrating their author's ability to bridge the language gap between Yahusha and the Bizarre intended audience. Right. Additional scholars have noted examples of wordplay that suggest that certain sayings were originally delivered in Hebrew or Aramaic. For example, Matthew 1 colon 21 says that Yahusha would be so named because he will save his people from their sins. You see, brothers and sisters. In Hebrew and Aramaic, he will save sounds like and has the same root Yasha as Yahusha. This reflects the common Old Testament practice of naming individuals with names that match the circumstances of their birth. But the obvious word play cannot come across in Greek. In another word, subtle example in Matthew 3, 9, John the Baptist says, In both Hebrew and Aramaic, the words for stone, Abnaim or Abnaya, right? Abnaim or Abnaya, and children, Banim or Benaya, right? literally means sons look and sound very similar the meaning of this saying is adequately translated into greek but the poetic quality of the likely underlying semitic wordplay is lost in translation because hebrew and Aramaic were so closely related and intermixed in first century palestine it is often difficult or even impossible to decide on which of the two languages saying like this were originally produced in other cases, scholars have noted that differences between the Bizarre or Gospel can be explained by different translation of a Semitic original. For example, in Matthew 23, 26, Yahushua commands the Pharisees to cleanse the inside of the cup and the plate. But in the parallel saying in Luke 11, 41, quotes Yahushua is saying that they need to give alms. This difference is puzzling to explain in Greek, but a long ago, Julius 
Well, Harrison observed that in Aramaic, cleanse is dako, D-A-K-K-O, dako, and give arms is zako, Z-A-K-K-O, zako, which not only sound very similar, but may also have been spelled the same way in Aramaic. In this case, it is likely that Matthew or Matthew and Luke differ because of different interpretation of the underlying Aramaic expression. The grammar and language of the Greek New Testament also reflect the influence of Semitic forms in other ways. One particular striking example is how writers sometimes add an extra redundant pronoun where it is common in Hebrew and Aramaic but not considered good Greek. For example, in Mark 7, 25, right, in the Greek literally reads, Whose her daughter had an unclean spirit? Whose her daughter had an unclean spirit? Which is an awkward in the Greek as it is in, in English. Mark also begins most of his paragraph with the word and, which is very odd for Greek text about normal in Semitic uses, right? So in other common grammatical structures in the Greek New Testament also seem to have been influenced by Semitic grammics like let's look at some uh, examples brothers and sisters right answering Yahusha said let's look at Matthias who let me call in 25 right 5 okay brothers and sisters Matthew Matthias who let me call in 25 is on the screen at that time Yahusha answered and said I thank thee O Abuna father Yahuwah of heaven and earth because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent has revealed and has revealed them to babes right so the truth is hidden from the wise and prudent which is our elders right and has revealed to them unto babes so it's us in this time this generation right so as you can see you know the similarities in the semitic grammar yahusha said me yahusha answered right so let's look at uh uh revelation 19 colon 16. and as you can see in 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 revelation is on the screen revelation 19 says you can see the the, the semitic grammar and he had on his vesture and on his thigh a name written king of kings and adonai of adonai Right, so for you Rasta out there, he's not talking about his majesty. His majesty is not does not Elohim. Right? This is talking about the Mashiach Yahusha, the savior of ethnic Israel. Right? He's a savior of ethnic Israel. Right? Okay, let's look at another one, brothers on your screen. Luke nineteen colon fifteen. Right, so that's Lucas nineteen colon fifteen, right? And you see the Semitic grammar again. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him to whom he had given the money that he might know how much every man had gained by trading, you see. Okay, let's look at one more brother says Lucas twenty two colon fifteen. That's Lucas twenty two colon fifteen, right? See and there you go again, brothers and sisters. The Semitic uh, grammar and he said unto them, with desire, I have desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So who's gonna suffer? Yahusha, Yahusha Mashiach, brothers and sisters, sisters right? The Savior of Israel, right? So these kinds of expressions, even if not totally impossible, in native greek speech and writing reflect the semitic background of the writers of the new testament they do not indicate that the new testament books were translated from hebrew or america however many of the new testament authors were bilingual or potentially even multilingual so it would be no surprise for one language to interfer with another and most of these semitic features in the greek of the new testament were well known to greek speaking Yuhadins and Elohim fearing Gentiles makes sense right because our people were in Greece right they were in Iraq Iran you know Babylon right those Medo Persia you know the Asia Minor we were there we were ethnic to that region 
northeast africa like, like i always say northeast africa and the surrounding areas right that's where paul knew where to go when the ten child was scattered only yahuda and benjamin was in Jerusalem and Levi also because Levi is scattered through all the 12 tribes right so again I, I, I have to reiterate over and over again when the most I say Yehuda Judah went to the captivity Judah is the head tribe but Judah was not the only one caught up in chattel slavery Benjamin was there and Levi was there also brothers and sisters you see so most of the Semitic features in the Greek of the New Testament were well known to Greek speaking Yuhadines and Elohim fearing Gentiles through the literal translation in the Septuagint. In a sense, they form a sort of mixed biblical Edom that shape how the New Testament writers spoke and wrote religious texts in the Greek language. This is similar to how a modern believer's prayers or speech about religious topics might be influenced by the King James in ways that would sound odd to most modern English speakers. How great thou art! If more to the point, when modern worship leaders cry out Hallelujah, Hosanna, or Amen, it by no means implies that they know Hebrew or Aramaic. <laughs> you see, brothers and sisters, so there is much evidence for an underlying Semitic language, especially Aramaic, for parts of the Gospel, particularly in the sayings of Yahusha. There is also considerable Semitic influence in the Greek language of many New Testament authors, but there is no linguistic reason to suppose that any of the complete Gospel or other New Testament books were originally written in Hebrew or Aramaic in their entirety, you see, brothers and sisters. So why do most modern scholars insist that the New Testament was originally written in Greek? We have already discussed how the presence of Semitic influence in the language of the New Testament need not indicate that the Greek texts were translated from Semitic languages. The Semiticism were very similar to readers of Greek translation of the Old Testament and became thoroughly ingrained in their own Greek writing. Furthermore, it is important not to exaggerate these Semitic elements. While they may stand out in sharp contrast to what would have been considered proper classical Greek, the discovery of many thousands of Greek papyri in the past 150 years has radically changed scholars' understanding of the everyday Greek in the 1st century AD, while earlier scholars sometimes emphasized the uniqueness of <coughs> Duhadin Greek against while earlier scholars sometimes emphasized the uniqueness of Jewish Greek against that of classical authors, scholars can now see how the Greek of the New Testament fits comfortably within the common or Kaoline Greek, a Koine Greek, spoken and written throughout the Eastern Mediterranean Greek as a lingual franca of the region was often used as used in a similar or simpler form that the classical authors and often reflect the influence of local custom and languages but still remain recognizable Greek. This is exactly what we see in the Greek writing of the authors of the New Testament and other Jewish works of the period. In short, the books of the New Testament ju look just like other Greek writings from the period. On the other hand, the book of the New Testament do not look like translation from Hebrew or Aramaic versions of the book. Scholars actually know a lot about what Jewish translation from Hebrew or Aramaic into Greek look like because all the Hebrew scriptures and many other works were translated into Greek before or around the, the first century AD. For most of these books, we know that the text in both the original language and the target language, in this case Greek, and can compare them word by word for many thousands of words to develop detailed profiles of how the translators worked. These subterranean Greek translations are now a well-developed field of study covering examples ranging from more to less literal and encompassing the idiosyncrasies of many individual translators even in the most free of these ancient translations. The Semitic base text constrain and influence translations to a much greater degree than could be supposed based on the Greek text of the 
New Testament. Translation regularly mimic the simple sentence structures of the estimatic sources where as the New Testament texts tend to have the more complex sentences that are characteristic of Greek literature writing. Translation tend to have a limited range of Greek vocabulary, grammatical practicals or particles that conventionally correspond to Semitic words and usage, whereas the New Testament texts frequently have more varied vocabulary and use particulars and expressions in ways that have no exact Semitic equivalents. Known translations also generally have a very consistent profile of translator translation technique throughout the entire translated book. In this regard, the greater evidence for Semitic language in the saying of Yahusha than in the surrounding narrative actually reinforce the argument that the entire Gospels could not have been written in Hebrew or Aramaic. If the Gospels had been translated in their entirety from Semitic originals, both the sayings and the narrative would have had a more constant or consistent profile rather than in fluctuating or fluctuating back and forth between Semitic sounding and proper Greek. Put simply, though the various books of the New Testament differ from each other in terms of style and level of writing, none of them looks like the known Greek translation from Hebrew or Aramaic text from the period. Another important indication regarding the original language of the New Testament is that the authors often use Greek sources. Many books of the New Testament are filled with Old Testament quotation and these are almost always cited from the Septuagint translation or revised Greek version of the Old Testament text. We cannot easily explain these ways as just borrowing from previous biblical translation while translating the whole book because the larger context sometimes depends on using the Greek text instead of the Hebrew for instance. In Hebrews chapter 10 colon 5 the author cited is Psalms 40 colon 6. In the Greek tradition that has the word body instead of the Hebrew text which reads ears, this reading from the Greek is important in the context of Yahusha body being the perfect sacrifice, which shows that the author must have been composing the text in Greek. Furthermore, scholars have long argued that the similarities in Greek were between the Synoptic Gospel Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are so close and extensive that some of them must have used the Greek text of one or more of the others as a source. Most common explanation is that both Matthew and Luke use Mark as a source, which is particularly important here since Matthew is the one gospel for which there is ancient speculation about a lost Hebrew Aramaic original. If, as most modern scholars suspect, Matthew used the Greek text or Mark as his main writing source and incorporated most of Mark in his gospel, it makes little sense to think of the present gospel of Matthew as a translation of a Hebrew or Amharic gospel. A similar situation can be seen in relationship between Jude and Second Peter, one of which used the Greek text of another as a main source from composing the text. The use of Greek sources by the New Testament authors is thus another strong indication that these works were originally written in Greek rather than Hebrew or Aramaic. So, brothers and sisters, here's some examples of Paul speaking uh, Hebrew and Greek. So, we know that he spoke Greek, Hebrew, and maybe Latin, right? The Latin conjure is based on the fact that he was Roman, and the official language of Rome was Latin. Right, brothers and sisters? So, okay, brothers and sisters, let's explore uh, two verses I proved that point that uh, Paul spoke two languages or more and two, right? Maazim Acts twenty six colon fourteen is on the screen, brothers and sisters. Maazim Acts twenty six colon fourteen. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying, in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecuted thou me? It is hard to to 
it's hard for thee to kick against the prick, brothers and sisters. Right? Right, brothers and sisters? And if you take a look at this, keep looking at the screen, right? Saul or Saul is a masculine given name of the Hebrew origin. It is the English form of the Hebrew name of the biblical king. The names translate to asked for or borrowed. You see, brothers and sisters, Saul. Right, Saul. Okay, brothers and sisters, take a look at take a look at it. we're going to look at another one, another scripture. Take a look at the screen, Acts 21, calling 37. And as Paul was to be led into the castle, he said unto the chief captain, May I speak unto thee, who said, Canst thou speak Greek? Right? Let's go a bit further, brothers and sisters. Let's go to 38 so we get that body context. Right? Art not thou that Egyptian? See that? Which before these days made us an uproar and led us out into the wilderness. 4,000 men that were murderers. So again, brothers and sisters, when the scriptures or when the scriptures ask the question, or when the ruler asks Paul the question, can thou speak Greek? Right? The Tilaric apparently expected his prisoners to have spoken Hebrew, i.e. Aramaic, and was surprised to hear Greek. Right? The people expected Greek and were surprised at Hebrew. Right, Acts the Marzine twenty two calling two. Nothing could better illustrate the, the familiarity of the population of Jerusalem with both languages. Right. So what Acts or uh, Marzine twenty one thirty eight means, brothers and sisters? Right, when it says, uh, or when 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 the ruler asks Paul, aren't you not the one that led? those murderers into the wilderness right Josephus speaks of one of one of one of that came out of Egypt to Jerusalem and gave out that he was a prophet and deceived the people whom he persuaded to follow him to the Mount of Olives where they should see the walls of the city fall at his command and so through the ruins of it they might enter into the city but felix the roman governor fell upon them killed 400 and took 200 prisoners and the egyptian fled the account which he elsewhere gives of him and eusebius from him is this a certain egyptian false prophet did much more mischief to the jews for he being a magician and have not and, uh, and having got himself to be believed as a prophet, came into the country of Judea and gathered together about 30,000 prisoners whom he had deceived. These he brought out of the wilderness of the Mount of Olive. So this character was mistaken of Paul when they asked the question, aren't you one of those who led those thousands of men into the wilderness? So that was a mistaken identity, you see. You see, brothers and sisters, right? Egyptian fled the account which he elsewhere given, gives of him and Eusebius from him. In this, a certain Egyptian false prophet did much more mischief to the Jews, for he being a magician and having got himself to believe as a prophet, came into the country of Judea and gathered together the wilderness, gathered together about 30,000 prisons or person who he had deceived these he brought out of the wilderness to the mount of olives from thence designing to take jerusalem by force and seize the roman garrison and take the government of the people by felix prevented his design right but felix prevented his design meeting him with the roman soldiers assisted by all the people so that when they engaged the Egyptian fled with a few and most of those that were with him were destroyed or taken. Now it was some little time before this that this affair happened. And by these accounts of Josephus, though the Egyptian was discomfited, yet he was not taken. He had made his escape so that he might be yet in being. And therefore the captain could not tell but Paul might be he right who had privately got into the city or privately got into the city and was upon some bad design 
right? So Josephus saying that he brought them out of the wilderness or led them through it to the Mount of Olives from thence to rush into Jerusalem when the wall should fall down at his command. But he says the number of men had that he led out were about 30,000. It may be at first there were more than 4,000, but afterwards were joined by others and increased to 30,000. Or among these 30,000, he had 4,000 murderers or sicari, right? So called from the little sword which they carried under their clothes and with them killed men in the daytime in the middle of the city, especially at the feasts when they mingle themselves with the people, brothers and sisters. So it's a, a, a mistaken identity when the ruler thought that the Paul was the Egyptian who led those thousands of murderers into the wilderness, you see, brothers and sisters. So, you know, everything is in context. You got to have that body context to understand the scriptures and led by Ruach HaKadosh. Right, brothers and sisters? Okay. Scholars have also pointed out literal features in some passages that seems to work only in Greek. For example, in John 3, a dialogue between Yahusha and Nicodemus hinges on the ambiguity in the Greek word anothen, which can mean either to be born from above or again. Yahusha seems to be implying that this rebirth needs to be of a heavenly origin by the power of the Spirit. And nuance which Nicodemus misses is with his response about being born again to an early to an earthly mother. The meaning of this text turns on the nuances of the Greek language it must have been spoken or written in, and it is perhaps not coincidental that here Yahusha interacts in Jerusalem with a high status. Jewish leader which a Greek name who literally would have been very comfortable speaking Greek. You see, let me go over this again. The meaning of this text turns on the nuances of the Greek language. It must have been spoken or written in and it is perhaps not coincidental that here Yahusha interacts in Jerusalem with a high status Jewish leader, right, Nicodemus, which I agree with a Greek name who likely would have been very comfortable speaking Greek, brothers and sisters. Right? So, and it claims that any of the canonical New Testament Gospels as we know them were originally composed in Hebrew or Aramaic are baseless and contrary to the linguistic evidence of the text themselves. Any Semitic sources that may have been used by the Gospel writers appears to have been limited in scope and must have been thoroughly reworked in composition processes of these works. Perhaps a good parallel of this might be the Jewish War by the Jewish historian Josephus. In his prologue to the Greek text, Josephus claimed to have written about the war previously in Aramaic for his compatriots, whereas now he has written his book in Greek, much like the New Testament. However, the Greek book we have today is so thoroughly Greek that it must have differed considerably from any lost Aramaic precursors. Hebrew American originals for the rest of the New Testament books are even more implausible than for the Gospel, though these books also contain Semitics and sometimes even Hebrew American words. For example, Marantha or Maranatha, our Danai comes in Aramaic in 1 Corinthians 16, 22, Abaddon, destruction in Hebrew or American, Revelation 9, 11. Their texts are so thoroughly Greek in structure and idiom that there can be no serious doubt about the original language. Furthermore, the, the epistles were explicitly written in the believers in mixed U.S. Gentile congregation outside of Palestine who could hardly have been expected to understand Hebrew or Amharic. Many of the individuals mentioned had Greek or Latin names. And Paul's secretary who helped him write the letter to the Romans had a Latin name, Tertius, right? You can see that in Rome 16, Colin 22. The, le the letter to the Hebrews, which some ancient authors suppose was originally written in Hebrew, depends on Greek Old Testament translation. Right? The letters to the Hebrews, which some ancient authors 
while well, suppose was originally written in Hebrew depends on Greek Old Testament translation and is written at such a high level of literacy Greek that no serious linguistic case can be made that it is a translation from a Semitic original. The book may have been written primarily to Greek speaking Jewish, the Hebrews, but it also certainly not composed in the Hebrew language. You see, brothers and sisters. So I hope you get a full understanding of, you know, what language was the New Testament was written in, right? It's a mixture of both brothers and sisters, right? It's a mixture of both Hebrew and Aramaic, you know, with with similarities, you see, brothers and sisters. So. On that no broke your what is ever broke your shamashiak shina shina vishina bless love and shalom.